are in any kind of relationship? Raise your hand. Yeah? Others of you are either lying or um, you just don't feel like it. You're a little still waking up this morning. Every single one of us is in relationships. And if you know relationships, then you know conflict, don't you? You know what it means to have some rub, to, to, to have some conflict, to have things not go your way, to f- experience frustration in a relationship. And what we tend to believe because of that is that if it's impossible to avoid confrontation or conflict, then it's also impossible to reconcile that relationship. Or maybe not all relationships, maybe it's possible for some relationships to experience reconciliation, but not that relationship, Pastor Dave. I mean, not that coworker who works three cubicles down. No way could I ever reconcile a relationship with her. No way could I ever reconcile a relationship with that neighbor of mine who every time he cuts his grass, he dumps the grass on my yard. No way could I reconcile anything with that guy, right? No way could I reconcile something with a classmate. No way can my roommate and I ever get back to that spot where we were when we just started being roommates. No way could I ever reconcile that marriage, that relationship, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, that friend, that mom, that dad, and God help us if we have to reconcile with another church person. Amen? I mean, my goodness, if we have to reconcile relationships with the person who's sitting across the room from us, then we need some help, don't we? That's the myth that I hope we bust this morning, this myth that reconciliation is impossible. Two weeks ago, we busted the myth that the quality of your relationships rest on the foundation of your ability to sustain them. Last week, we busted the myth that God can't relate to me and I'm better off by myself. I would highly encourage you, if you're in any kind of relationship and you were not here the last two weeks, go online and check out those, those, passage, those sermons because it sets the foundation for where we go today. Busting the myth that reconciliation is impossible. In 1964, there's a man who is sentenced to life in prison for trying to reconcile, for trying to bring racial equality. This man went on to be set free from prison 27 years later, won the Nobel Peace Prize within three years of being released from prison, and then became the president of that country. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Nelson Mandela. A man who sought reconciliation, a man who strived for people to come to an understanding that there is no superior race, that people should not, be, should not be discriminated upon because of their skin color. This was a man who sought reconciliation. If anything should be impossible on that kind of scale, it should be that situation. I mean, that kind of puts my relationship with a college roommate in a whole different ballpark, doesn't it? I mean, it kind of paints a little bit of hope for a relationship with a friend that I haven't talked to in a year or a sibling who doesn't get along with me. It gives me hope that reconciliation is possible. And what I hope we do today is paint the picture that no matter the relationship, reconciliation is possible. And not only is it possible, but it can give new Life, And if you want to learn how to bring about this reconciliation, if you want to know how this starts or where you find it or where to learn about to bring that kind of change into your life, in your relationships, then you need to look within yourself. Now, that sounds like a cult built on self-help books to say, look within yourself to find your destiny, right? I don't mean it like that. What I'm saying is that we ourselves have had to encounter or go through reconciliation to the point that would be so unbelievable that on 
just first glance, you would say, that could never be done. But I'm telling you, it has happened, is happening, or will happen in your life. And here's how I know that. Will you turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5. And I, want to, I was hoping to, to read through this whole chapter, but I want to just get to the goods. Romans chapter 5, look down at verse 9. Romans 5, verse 9, answering the question, is reconciliation possible? And if you want to know where it begins, look within yourself. Here's why I say that. Romans 5, verse 9 says this, Since we have now been justified by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Jesus? For if when we were God's enemies, whoa, hold up, what? Verse 10, for if when we were God's enemies, when, when was I an enemy of God? We'll come back to that. For if when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son Jesus, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You see, if you want to learn how to reconcile any relationship that you have, if you want to learn how to bring healing and forgiveness and possibly start talking to somebody again who you haven't talked to in a long time, if you want to know how to bring resolution to the conflicts that are in the middle of your relationships, your marriages, your friendships, your roommates, your classmates, your coworkers, whatever it may be, if you want to know how, then it starts with you. Because contrary to popular belief and what you would like to believe, you have had to go through the most incredible reconciliation known to mankind, and that is the reconciliation back to relationship with God the Father Almighty. You see, when we were born, we were born into sin. And what sin does is it automatically separates us from God. We're born into it. I can't believe, and I never thought I would have ever quoted Lady Gaga, but you were born that way. You were born with sin. You were born separated from God. Don't believe me? Listen to these passages here in uh, Psalm 51, verse 5. It says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. That was Psalm 51, verse 5. Romans 3 says this. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Well, Dave, how, how can you say that? I mean, I, I woke up this morning and thought, you know, it's a good idea to go to church because I need God. Well, Yes, you're right. But do you know who's prompting you to think that and to, to follow through on that? That's the Holy Spirit in at work in you, bringing you to faith, stirring in you in such a way to say and acknowledge, as we said in Psalm 100 this morning, acknowledge that the Lord is God. That is the Spirit of God drawing you nearer to himself because no one seeks God, and we are only, at best, verse 10, God's enemies from the get-go. Now, the word enemy, it's not just, that. don't take it lightly. Here's what the Greek word really gets to the heart of when it says enemy. It says, someone who is openly hostile, someone who is deep-seated in hatred. And this word enemy, it implies irreconcilable hostility. In other words, you're too far gone, there's no chance that you're ever able to reconcile yourself to God. And when it says you were an enemy of God, I mean, it gets to the dirty, grimy <coughs> details of just how hostile we are born into this life towards God. Irreconcilably hostile towards God. And yet the beautiful thing that 
Romans 5 points out for us. And the thing that, that really gives us a key for how we bring about reconciliation in our, in our relationships is that we have one who paid the price so that we could be, be reconciled to the Father. Look back here at Romans 5, beginning in verse 9. Look at it again. It says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, verse 11, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What Romans 5 is saying is that, church, we should celebrate that it's our birthday, but we should celebrate all the more that we are no longer enemies of God, hostile towards him, so hostile that there should be nothing that can reconcile you back to relationship with him. Not only were we born into that, but now because of Jesus, what was once thought impossible is now possible because Jesus went to the cross for me. That is good news. What was once thought impossible, I am living proof that it is possible, but only because of Jesus. That is good news. Well, good for me then, and good for you, right? Thank you, God, that I'm in. I'm, I'm comfortable now. I'm just warming up. We don't have pews here, but I'm just warming up at my table and making sure that this is my table and that nobody else sits at this table because this is, this is my spot. This is where I get my Jesus thing on, and, and thank God I'm reconciled. I'm, I'm just sitting into my comfort zone. Is that how we respond to the goodness of God? I don't think so. Look in the next chapter, chapter 6, Romans 6, verse 1. It says this, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And, and it goes on. In fact, let's keep reading here. Verse 3, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ... Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. In other words, you've been reconciled so that you can bring that kind of transformation into the lives of the people you have relationship with. Which means we don't just get to stand by and say, sucks to be you, I'm awesome because I've been reconciled. Hope you find your way. I mean, we can't just sit still in our neighborhoods. I mean, thank God for Harvest Hands and the incredible model that you guys set for us and the inspiration you are for us that we might see what it looks like to do life with other people in our neighborhoods just so that they might encounter the kind of grace that I've encountered. And they might know Jesus. You see, we're not just reconciled to be changed. We're also reconciled to be changers. Where God works through us to bring that kind of reconciliation. I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. Maybe they don't want religion. Maybe they don't want a Bible shoved down their throat. Maybe they don't want churchy people talking churchy things to them. But I know that every person around me longs to live in peace in their relationships. Nobody I know says, you know what I love? I love it when I can just get into conflict with everybody I know. That is just the best thing ever. Nobody says that. Everybody wants to know that kind of peace, that kind of reconciliation, that kind of hope. And we can only see it in Jesus. So how do we do that? And here's where it gets specific. Here's where it gets tangible. Here's where it gets hard for you. Because now, not only can you be reconciled, but now you are a reconciler. In other words, now you are called to be the first ones to go 
and make relationships right again. So here's three things that, as I've been reading through this passage, I just pick up on what Jesus has done in my life and done in your life that we can learn from on what it means to go and be reconcilers. Would you just write these down, whether it's a, because every one of us is in relationship. Grab a piece of paper. Here's three things. The three words are this, go, give, and give. Go, give, and give. The first one is go. Go first. Go first. The Bible says, this is love. Not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. Be the initiator of reconciliation. Yeah, but Pastor Dave, you just don't know, you don't even know what that person's done to me. You don't even know the ways that they've hurt me. You don't even know what they've done to, to, to just remember. You were irreconcilably hostile towards God when you were born into a sinful world. God should have wanted nothing to do with you. And yet he gave up his son for you to die the death that you should have died. And you are alive. Go first. Be the first to initiate. Second one, give. Give them more grace than they deserve. Give them more grace than they deserve. Can you imagine if... if if God wouldn't have completely filled the bill, like wouldn't have met the complete demands of what our sin earns us. I mean, can you imagine if he just kind of like went halfway with forgiving us our sins and like, you know, a few years into his ministry said, eh, the cross doesn't sound all that good. I'm just going back home to heaven. And he's like, I taught them a few good things. I taught them how to live and, and what they should do, not do. And that should be good enough. They're good. Man, that ain't good enough. I'm still in sin if that's the case. I'm still hopeless if that's the case. But Jesus went all the way to the cross to give his life for me, which is far beyond what I deserve. People in our lives are longing to have somebody give them grace after grace after grace. And they're waiting to see if it will run out, which is the third one. Go first, give them more grace than they deserve. The third one, give without ceasing. You can be extra generous. You can give lots of grace. But if people see that the grace we believe in runs out at some point, there's like an expiration or if you hit this number of sins against me, then it's done. Then if I'm them, I want nothing to do with the God that you believe in. And this is where it's hard. Because man, that coworker is there every day. That roommate is always well, you live with them, and they're always there. And man, it's so hard when, when you have to give grace, and not just grace, but give more than they deserve, and, and then to just keep giving it, and keep giving it, and keep giving it. Yeah. Because that's what Jesus does with you. That's what he does with me. He keeps giving more grace than I deserve. And because of that, I am reconciled back to him.